Well, good afternoon to everybody. Glad to be a part of this. Hello, Brad, my fine friend, Dr. Francis from the other world. Hello there, Aunt Judy. <laughs> it's a delight to have you. Thank you very much. So we'll uh, uh, leave you in the hands of the wonderful Brad Gilly. Yes, uh, and thank you for being a sponsor this week. You're one of our Race Industry Week sponsors. So thank well, thank you. you. We appreciate being part of the program. So thank you. Very good. Yes. So awesome. Brad, you'll appreciate that um, this week in St. Louis is an interesting venue. It's the fifth year for uh, Dirt in December or the Gateway Dirt Classic where, um, you know, we're racing both uh, modifieds and late models in the dome where the future or the previous football team, the Rams used to play. So we're making better use of uh, the facility with some big dirt racing this weekend indoors. Uh, which I think is fantastic. And, you know, it's, it's funny, Gordon, because uh, uh, a couple of years ago, we got to do this together here on Race Industry Week and Kenny Wallace was with you. And I thought to myself, yeah. Oh, I wonder, no, Kenny's probably going to be really, really busy this weekend with all of that. But um, look, it's always great every time you're on here. I know you've been on here way more than you and I have been able to do these, but uh, I, I think it's great to talk about the uh, the service that you have to offer for sure. No, outstanding. Thank you. It's uh, Kenny's actually racing today. Some of the other folks, actually one of our cars raced last night and Kenny's racing tonight. So it's a uh, half of each night and then they'll all circle back tomorrow to try to make the feature. So you're exactly right. He's down there entertaining the groups, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely, which is great. Well, yeah. uh, today's topic uh, with Performance Plus Global Logistics, how to win with logistics during uncertain times. So give us an overview of what we're going to be talking about here today, Gordon. Sure. Um, we thought it was valuable in the fact that I think a lot of people, whether it be from the carriers, they're utilizing, you know, what's happening globally with transportation. Everybody talks about the, the lack of product due to supply chain. And then most currently, it's interesting since this, we've kind of basically initiated this particular discussion, we have the potential rail strike. So it's, it's really, I think we, we came through COVID with, um, I would say, success. And then now everybody's becoming more and more concerned as to how their freight's going to get delivered, what's going to happen with it. And we continue to emphasize, most importantly, that really proper packaging is important because the carriers are understaffed and the damages continue to increase as far as delays. And so that's what we thought would be a value to kind of make sure people are thinking on those lines. And as we go into the end of the year, to prepare for weather and things like that. You know, that's, that's a great point and a, and a really interesting thing to bring up, which by the way, before we get too far into it, I would like to remind anyone watching here today that if you do have a question for Gordon, feel free to type it into the chat as well. And we can definitely talk about some of the things that you want to talk about. But, you know, I always think to myself, especially when it comes to working within the service industry and it, heck, when it comes to something as important as what you do, because when people are shipping something, it's obviously very important to them how helping the people who are helping you makes the world go around so much better. And I think packaging falls right into that. Indeed it does. I think that, you know, five years ago, uh, even three years ago, we were, we were just used to the fact that a truck would drive up and pick up an engine on a pallet. It was fine. Somebody was sending drums of fuel, oil, whatever it may be, any place. We really weren't as concerned with the packaging and it's becoming more and more prevalent. Uh, restrictions are becoming greater. We actually, interestingly enough, yesterday had two transmissions. They were NHRA pro stock transmissions that one of them was leaking. And so of course it was a one day air freight, quite expensive is going te for a test and the carrier would not release it because it was leaking. Of course, we called the location that shipped it, one of our customers and oh no, it was dry. Well, of course it wasn't dry because the entire crate had you know fluid coming from it. Well, what happens then is the carrier's not sure what the fluid is, then it becomes a hazardous good, and then it, it just delays everything and it's causing other, other products to be damaged. So things like that, we just don't really think about um, until that happens to us. The other, the other pieces of it are is that we're, we're becoming more and more, um, I think, driven by the carrier, what they will and won't accept. And, and now they're, we're finding things that are oversized, they're not accepting them, they're charging more. Uh, we work with a lot of uh, industry-related awning companies, people that build the awnings for trailers, things like that. They always have products that are over 10 foot long. Less than 30% of the carriers will accept those now. So then we have to find other places to move them. So those are things that the packaging is really an interesting example. Our display for the PRI show this next week, we've, it's coming from China. Imagine that. But all of a sudden, part of the product is coming and it's over 10 foot long. Well, now 
It shows in Shanghai. It, here, what are, we're less than a week away. And the shipper was not thinking that way because they, you know, they just manufacture it and send it out with DHL. So now we've got to figure out how we're going to rescue that. And we may just put up a folding chair and say we're here at the show. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I, I hope you don't have to do that. I hope it's uh, <laughs> it, it's much more than that and, and is uh, is a lot better. You know, Gordon, the one thing that really did impress me, I remember the first time we talked, and when you talk about selecting a carrier in this, I mean, obviously for you at uh, Performance Plus Global Logistics, you have such a variety of people who you work with, but also knowing the right people for the right product that you're shipping as well. Can you speak more about that? Yes, that's thank you, Brad. It's a great question. So our software that we've created, and we've created a specific one, it's called a TMS, Transportation Management System. And we provide that to the customers. There's no cost. And we built it for carriers that are specific to the industry. And then if we know somebody that would be in that sense, that would be a, an awning manufacturer or whatever, we just provide them with the carriers that we have negotiated tariffs or rates with that reduce some of those added costs, things like that. On the, on the traditional side, if it's somebody that's, uh, I previously noted one of the commercials with Total Seal, something at Matt Hartford's team or something's working with, you know, they're car they have carriers just specific to small package that are going to service them. And then on the, on the larger freight, we have, I don't know, several hundred engine manufacturers that we try to make sure that we not only have the right carrier, but we have ones that have the, the better tariffs where they have some form of uh, retribution if there's damage. And then in turn to that, we've built into our software an insurance solution to where when they're creating the shipment, it says, would you like to insure this, put in the amount, and it automatically creates an individual certificate for that, for that shipment. That's become very, very valuable. It's less than 10% of the cost of the shipment. And we're probably seeing 70, 80% of the people doing it. So we're putting it at their fingertips. So we're all of a sudden, unfortunate damage occurs. And they realize that they got a dollar a pound on a, you know, 600 pound Sonny Leonard motor that was $200,000. And they're like, okay, I got $600 on a $200,000 motor. It doesn't work. So, so those are some of the things that we're putting in place right at their fingertips and allowing them to be able to, to use those. So um, absolutely beneficial. Um, and then we have a team of people that answer the phones. A lot of people necessarily, probably less than half of our racing industry wants to do it online. They want to call, they text, um, they Facebook message, all the things that are that are urgent or that are quick, but don't necessarily you know use our software. So we do that. We had multiple people that um, half our people were down at the dirt in December because we're supporting that as a sponsor, getting texts down there. We need to book this. We need this. We need this at the race, things like that. So that's what happens daily. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, I'm sure it's not just the racing world, but I, I would imagine it's fairly prevalent within it though. Um, as far as, uh, Hey, uh, we just finished this. We have to get it there now. Um, as far as defining a time for delivery, how does all of that work? And, and what's the benefit with performance plus are the carriers and the partners that we have noted, we basically have in our software, what would be a, um, on the less than truckload LTL, which is kind of how the country moves. It'll give you what, uh, basically a target date. They'll say it should be there one, two or three days. Those aren't guaranteed, but that gives you a ballpark. When it's air freight, it's very, very measurable and specific. And it's going to say it's a one day, two day. Uh, most of our uh, World of Outlaw uh, sprint car teams, things like that. A lot of the folks that are running IMSA, we're run those are almost all air freight. And so we're able to be very, very specific and when it's picked up, when it's delivered, and then provide um, instantaneous tracking that's right from our system. So those are I think that's the best way to describe it. We have some, uh, I noted four sets of wheels from Taylor Weld this week that are, have to go someplace for a test, TJ Forge. So um, all of a sudden they didn't want them in four days, they needed them tomorrow. And so of course those are gonna show up and arrive at the facility, they'll mount them and they'll be on the track. So absolutely we provide that solution, give them the options. Um, when the initial order comes in, everybody says it's not urgent, it doesn't have to be there. And all of a sudden, two hours later, can I get it there tomorrow? And how's that going to work? That's, you know, that's, that's generally what happens. Yeah, I'm sure. Well, what, you know, when you talk about air freight versus surface transport, though, you know, let's just say I can be ahead of the game and I actually want to save myself a few bucks uh, in being able to do that. What kind of cost difference are we talking about? Uh, that's a good question. I'm saying we're probably going to be uh, probably double if it's going to be air freight, depending on the distance and things like that. If we're just going to take a traditional um, you know, Indy to Charlotte or something like that. It's, it's a very, it's probably less than double or less than double the cost. If we're going to look at a, a Charlotte and it's going to, let's turn it around and say, if it's going to go from Shaver, big, big sprint car engine builder, you're familiar, and they're going to send something to Charlotte. It's going across the country. 
you're probably um, you know, seventy five percent more. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's good to know. I mean, that's actually really important, especially in today's world uh, when we're all watching our budgets and everything else. You, you'd mentioned the rail strike, Gordon. How much is that affecting the industry right now? And uh, literally before I got on a plane today from Nashville to come back to Fort Worth, uh, I think I saw where maybe Congress had signed something to prevent the strike. What what can you tell us about that and how it might affect your industry, your business? Well, it's, this is the second time that that the government or Congress has stepped in. The it's interesting that basically 30 to 40 percent of like what we would consider automotive related freight travels by rail, even though it's picked up with LTL a truck, then the truck or the trailer is put on rail. And so I think more of our general products, whether it be something retail that would be from a department stores, Walmart, things like that, probably more than 50 percent are rail. And so just 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 as a note, um, what we found is and that's basically we found that we have always kept it on the ground or basically surface transport because you can't rescue it when it's by rail. In other words, if somebody, and rail is a prop is basically about 15% less when it would, you know, it's going to go rail than LTL. But what we find is, is if a, a delayed LTL shipment, we can get to a terminal and we can, with a little bit of extra work, we can have the freight pulled. We can then move it by air and get it where it needs to go. If it's moved by rail, you have no option. It's on a rail yard. Some it's I've yet to have, but less than 1% experience or success doing that. So from our standpoint, if this strike would have take place or would happen, it will basically put all of that freight back into the traditional surface system. It, we're at a full capacity right now. So that's would be the biggest challenge. Um, so that's why they have to intervene. It would, it would, I bet I would say it would stop the country for a few days. It would shut us down. Wow. And that's interesting, though, when you bring that up, uh, you know, as far as it, hey, look, if it's on the road, then it can stop and, and you can get it off, like you said. But yeah, I guess on rail until it gets to the spot where it's going. Um, boy, I could see where that be, uh, would be a big challenge. Uh, there's a question from the chat, Gordon, uh, from David McQuinn. It says, if I heard correctly, they're a TMS solution. Are their partners, the shippers also connected to Oracle and SAP? Or do the shippers only connect via a P plus? And some of these things that a little foreign language to me. So help translate if you would. No, David, that's a great question. So we do have integration capabilities with Oracle. We do have integration capabilities with SAP. And what he's basically asking us, um, Brad, is he's saying that those, those platforms are what are considered very large platforms that a large manufacturer will then put their inventory in and their entire company may run off of that. That would be, you could use it someone like Monsanto or uh, let's use Brandt, Justin Agar's sponsor, Brandt. So Brandt, Rick Brandt's company would utilize one of those to have an inventory management globally of their product. And then they want to be able to take a look at how the transportation is going to be able to, number one, track and trace from the order level. They don't have to go to two different facilities. So we do integrate with both. Uh, it's programming on both sides, but we actually have a back-end integration team and our software, our entire software group is in Southern California, Huntington Beach. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, uh, and, yeah. And yeah, definitely a great question because now <laughs> I just learned something new. Um, yeah. International, um, you know, we talked about air and ground, um, you know, a lot of international, there's a big, big body of water in between. How does all of that work for you guys? And how do you help with those solutions? Paperwork is key. Paperwork is key. Um, right now in this, in the, you know, the kind of the marketplace we're in right now, we can ship to just about all countries. We've got some things today um, going to Poland. Of course, they're, as you can imagine, um, supporting the war efforts in the Ukraine. Um, there are very few places that we can't ship internationally, you know, unless it's something that's a war zone or something like that. Um, what's most important is the, the most thorough details possible. You need to have basically what's called a manufacturer's data sheet, MSDS, on anything that would be manufactured so that it can be then shared with customs. We have commercial invoices. We help the customer with all of that. Um, there are some countries that you will ship to and from, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates that require a stamp, a Chamber of Commerce stamp. You can ship something if you were based in Mooresville, North Carolina, and happened to be uh, Ricky Stenhouse or whoever it is. Okay, so we're going to ship something from Mooresville. They would then re be required to have the local chamber stamp on their engine or whatever they're shipping if they're sending something to Saudi. Um, and so there will be times that we'll actually help someone. We'll have a local person go get the stamp. But so that's unusual, but it's more. It's becoming more prevalent. Um, Mexico is very is always a difficult location. 
because each border has a different customs broker across, depending on where you're, where you're crossing. So um, we, have, we have various brokers that we work with to help the customers. Um, most places in Asia are very, very friendly. Um, just depending on where in China, there could be some challenges with COVID still. And, you know, occasionally there'll be a location shut down. We'll lose a little bit of time. All of Europe and the EAU community is, um, is very friendly, seems to be congruent. Italy is the toughest. So um, but we're shipping to just about every country daily, um, both in inbound, inbound and outbound. So um, we've got, whether it be small package parts that would be performance related. Um, at times we've done some charters that are very large quantities of freight. And then just some, uh, very, very often we're shipping cars internationally there, whether it's a, a pro mod that's going back over to, you know, to the shake or, or something like that. So we've got some cars right now going, of course, to Australia for the midget week and things down there and even containers of freight for some of the folks that are gonna run the USAC guys going overseas. So uh, paperwork, number one. Number two, contact, most important contact internationally with a very good phone number and email address, how to get in touch with them when they arrive. Um, and then if anybody in an offshore country outside the US, most of them have a broker, like we have an insurance agent. So it's very, very, very common that they have a broker. So if they share their broker, we do everything. We communicate with their broker. They're already ready to receive it. They can pay the duty on ta duty and tax prior to even arriving. Very streamlined. Um, I had somebody today that was asking for quotes to, to Brussels, um, Singapore, four different locations around the world. Each one of them had no more than four day air service. Some of them were two day. So, so definitely we, we provide that service. Yeah. I was going to ask, is there, is there predictability depending on where something is going in the amount of times it takes to clear customs and, and obviously with everything that you know, and your experience, how performance plus really helps with that. Air freight wise, we can, we can nail down the, the transit. We'll the pickup delivery, everything like that, depending on the location as the broker is key. If they have a broker, it generally will pre-clear, which is the most important part. They'll clear in the air. If we're utilizing a, a DHL or a FedEx, they have the most expeditious process. If we're using moving something large and it's through us and it's a forwarder, then we'll basically let them know if the paperwork is correct. We'll have pre-approved it. So very few locations take more than two days. No, oh, that's not bad. And then right. you mentioned having the broker. Um, explain that process and what you're talking about. You know, do you have a broker? What, what goes on there? Yes. So a customs broker would be um, even visualizing, let's just, let's look back 50 years ago or something like that or longer, that each country had a location that was basically their freight person at that entry in that city. And when it came in, they're the ones that inspected it coming from another location. They basically owned that market and they were the ones that were responsible for, was, did it come in? Was it correct? Did it have the proper SIC code? You know, is somebody sending something in that's going to be taxed appropriately? They're not going to take revenue from that sit from that country. That's the key. So that broker then is responsible, has the proper licensing bonds and things like that. So when they have that person, it's very, very streamlined. If anybody that has habitual shipments on, you know, more than after the first and second one, it's almost automatically clear. It's the first one that they're looking at. They're determining is that is that customer a business? Who are they? Why are they receiving that product? Things like that. Um, you would think that the Middle East and places like that would be stricter, but they're not as much as uh, Italy is the, is the most unique of every place in the world right now. Why is that? Uh, I, I am not certain after, you know, traveling there and things like that. I, I think that they're very much uh, European where they're not in a hurry. Um, they don't really realize anything should be that urgent and they're just going to go to lunch. <laughs> that's, <laughs> In all honesty, that's we've yet to figure it out. And so we, we're very big on air freight there as opposed to something that would be deferred ocean because it could take an extended time and clearance takes longer. Yes. Wow. All right. Um, let's talk about duties, taxes, additional fees and all of that, Gordon. And, you know, maybe how your company does business versus other companies. You know, can someone get themselves in a situation where they think, oh, wow, this is a great shipping deal. And then they realize that what's not quoted or what is on the back end of that are additional duties versus maybe what you might be able to tell someone as far as like being able to control everything and, and do it all turnkey. Absolutely. So that's, that's a great question again. And what happens is, is the transportation is very, it's, you know, if you have the correct dimensions and you basically have a commodity that you're shipping, it's going to go from point A to point B in a timely manner and we'll have the price will be correct. When we get down to the duty and tax, 
that's based on the value basically of what the product is. And so if we're sending, let's just use the example if we're sending four um, new sprint car wheels that they've made from uh, TJ Forks. And they're ones that have uh, titanium bolts. They're, they're the, all the cool stuff. They're 500 bucks a piece. You got four of them. It's $2,000. You need to make sure that you either, number one, have your, you're going to send with them what would be your bill of sale, your invoice, stating what you paid for it, number one. Number two, they're, we're going to provide what would be an SIC code that would be for an aluminum wheel. So it's already going to have a basically an established code that said this is what this should be based under and how it's taxed. Now, if, if somebody would go to, depending, if you just logged on to FedEx and said, I want to ship this or went to a other a freight forwarder and said, I'm going to ship some wheels. Well, then they're going to look and they're going to go, are they steel? Are they aluminum? What do they have with them? How are they made? You know, where were they manufactured? Country of manufacturers is key. You could send wheels out of here and if they were made in Mexico, but shipped from the US, they would be held because they would look and see they had a Mexico stamp on them. So number one, duty and tax is based off the value. And, it's and the tax is basically what the country that it's going to is going to lose, lose in revenue. And so that's why they're, 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 they, didn't, they weren't able to receive. So that's crucial. The thing to keep in mind too, uh, in our racing community and, and you know, myself owning a few race teams and doing this a long time, we're all, gonna, we're all going to kind of say that, that those wheels are really only worth $400 and not 2,000. So you, you have to kind of, you have to be somewhat, um, You've got to use a little bit of sense and say you might be able to get it by with twelve hundred dollars, but you know make sure you've got a bill of sale that said twelve hundred. But if they go online and look in the catalog in in Jags or Summit, you know Kenny's friends at Jags or Summit that runs the modified series, and they see those wheels in there, they look online, they get, they check the price, they know what they should be. So that's key. You've got to make sure you're doing that. New versus used. Something that's new is going to go through a lot quicker because they can assess the product. Something used, they're going to come back. And uh, our idea of used may be different than theirs. So those are some things that duty and tax come up very quickly. The broker, in most cases, thinks basically the recipient side will pay the duty and tax. It arrives, and then the broker pays the tax for them and bills the customer. There are things that we can ship out U.S. outbound, and they're basically paid prior duty and tax at you know at the shipping side. But we don't necessarily have a hundred. There are very few countries that can tell us 100% what the duty and tax is going to be specifically today on what's gonna arrive next Thursday. So it's, but basically that's going to be basically an estimate. So then the customer very well get a, another bill that said this is another $120 for added duty and tax. And those are things that people get and get frustrated. Well, I thought you told me this was the price. Other things with that are, so we've sent those four wheels and we sent them to Australia. Somebody's gonna race over there in some type of an event. They got there and they put $1,200 instead of $2,000. Now they get put to the side and they're going to be looked at next week. Maybe it takes another week. Every day they sit there, they charge you. Those, oh. those four wheels are, you know, don't weigh anything. They take up a little space. So that might be $25 a day. If you have a, an engine in a crate, it might be $50 a day. It's all in density. The big things are when we're sending containers both places, when they arrive and they're being held for basically for inspection, Hundred to three hundred dollars a day. Wow. Long Beach Port has thousands of containers. They sit there. We are daily getting as quickly as we can get them out of there when they release them because they charge you storage. Those are things that, as you'd ask, why do people get additional bills? So those are things. If the broker can't clear it, it sits there and they charge you. So we want to have the broker in line, in email, communicating with us, telling us immediately so we can go in with the right paperwork and pull it. Doesn't matter if it's in Kuala Lumpur or if it's in Long Beach. So those are big things that are at a cost. Wow. Yeah, I could see that. Uh, so if I'm shipping, um, and, and let's say I know I'm going to be shipping either frequently or a lot, or I kind of know what it is, what's, what's more important when it comes to saving you know, money? Um, is, it, is it weight? Is it dimensions? If I think that, hey, if I could fill up a whole truck, is that cheaper than doing a partial truck? How do, how do those things work, and how can Performance Plus help? Three questions there. Those are, there's three answers. Number one. If uh, a full truck is going to be, it's, it's actually the safest way to ship because number one, you're basically going to, we're going to contract the truck to go from point A to point B. It's going to go from Charlotte to Dallas or Fort Worth. It's going to come see you. Okay. So it's not going to get unloaded five times. So we're not going to be worried about damage, cross docking, or unfortunately potential theft. Okay. So that's the best, but it's, it's more expensive because you're buying the whole truck. The next portion would be possibly 
if you have more than six pallets of product. So maybe you're, maybe you're Scribner Plastic and you're going to send uh, Smiley's, our friends down there that are the Hoosier dealer down at Smiley's. Okay, there yep. you go. So we're going to send Smiley's, you know, six, seven pallets of Scribner's and they're going to be fuel jugs, they're going to be engine, everything like that. We want to put him in a partial and buy more space in the truck so that that number one, it doesn't get unloaded, but he's basically consolidated. That's, I re we recommend that and we'll find a partial to do that. So the next thing that we're going to suggest is, is that the, the more dense the freight and this, and I'll, this, you'll, you'll think about this for a minute, but everything traveling domestically with LTL and 70% of our freight travels LTL, less than truckload. It's on a pallet. Okay. It, they all have a freight class and they started a, basically a, a pallet of bricks, very dense, good freight, um, comic books, magazines. That's class 55, low number. Let's go to the other side. We've got a pallet of ping pong balls. So they don't weigh anything. They take up the same amount of space. That's class 400. So an engine is class 85. So we're going to help them say we need to get as dense as possible, condense it to the smallest amount possible so that it, it's, it's basically effective in space, density, and that gets the best price to it. We help people, you know, don't just put a small box on a pallet. Maybe we can move that another way. Those are ways that we, we help them on a daily basis. What are the dimensions? What are the details? What's the freight class so they don't get an added cost or an added bill? Well, Gordon, I will say this. Even if someone might have a question that they don't even know of today, the one thing that definitely comes out of having you on here every time is that you know your business and you know this business yeah. and we can all benefit from that. Well, I appreciate that. And, you know, that was kind of our goal when we started this. And, you know, when Judy and I were back when I worked at FedEx and, you know, a couple of years when I built that program at DHL, our job was to help the racing and performance community be educated on ways to do this. The carriers do a great job, but they're not necessarily worried about how to save money and do it with the most efficiency. And that's our job to help with that and make everybody be able to ship more, sell more products and get products that are delivered and non-damaged. That's our job. And, and you do a brilliant job at it. Registering on EPAR Trade is easy. To start, click on the Join for Free button on the homepage. First, search your company to see if it's already in our database. If you see your company on the list, click on it to select it. Then, choose Claim Company if you are one of the decision makers, an owner, marketing person, or main company contact. Or choose Join Company if you are an employee, and press Continue. If you couldn't find your company in our database, select Register a New Company. On the following page, fill out your name, email, phone number, job title, and choose a secure password. If you chose register a new company, you'll need to choose your business type. Select supplier if you're looking to display products or services and connect with buyers. Choose racing business if you're looking to source new parts and connect with suppliers. Choose race team if you own or are a member of a professional race team. Then enter your company name please provide a website, Facebook page, or LinkedIn if you have one, and choose to either claim or join the company. You can view and agree to our terms of use here. If you'd like to receive our weekly newsletter, choose Accept. Finally, click Register Now and your registration will be submitted for approval. An email will be sent to your inbox. Please confirm your email address and you will be approved shortly. Welcome to ePartrade.